Uh, welcome everyone who's uh, joined us. Um, uh, we're going to uh, talk today about uh, website design. Um, Landon has returned from his hiatus. Uh, thanks, Landon, for, for rejoining us. Um, our guest today is Guy Takalakis uh, with uh, Attorney Sync. He is an attorney. I'm going to let him actually do his formal uh, in introduction. Um, but um, uh, I've seen him uh, around town. I've seen him uh, at uh, various events, uh, tech show and other places. He's also got an article in this book, uh, which uh, um, uh, many of you might have. We've distributed this uh, quite widely, uh, The Secrets of uh, uh, to Marketing and Automating Your Law Practice. There's a nice um, uh, overview of some of the basics of website design from Guy in this text. Um, if you need a copy of this, let me know. I can send you a link. It's available as an ebook. Uh, but uh, welcome, Guy. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and what you do? Sure. So uh, thanks for having me. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm still a licensed lawyer, uh, but about, gosh, 12 or 15 years ago, somewhere in that time uh, frame, uh, as a young lawyer, I was tasked with going out and exploring what can we do at the firm to market ourselves online, came back with a bunch of um, ideas and was told, uh, by a lot of different lawyers that, uh, you know, I don't think people are really going to use the internet to hire lawyers. And I was like, agree to disagree. And uh, out of that, a business was born. That was Attorney Sync. And so we've been helping lawyers uh, build websites, uh, fix websites, uh, manage paid media campaigns, social media, you know, basically everything you can do online. Um, that's what we focus on. And we work with lawyers across the U.S. and Canada currently, and uh, just love to help lawyers understand some of this stuff. And uh, that's what I hope to, to talk about today. And, you know, to everybody that's listening, we don't have to limit it just to website design. If you don't want, if you got any questions about marketing your practice online or digital marketing in general, I'm happy to try to uh, field those and um, just grateful to be here today. Thanks for, for, for joining us. As I, as we were chatting about a little earlier on, um, you know, the reason we talked about um, a website design is it just appears that uh, a lot of attorneys right now as a result of uh, the pandemic have uh, additional downtime. Um, uh, folks in the uh, round table that's hosted by Tim Bayland um, uh, have been saying uh, that they are uh, taking this time to rebuild their website. And the, the questions were, were very, very basic. Um, uh, in, in, you know, how do I register a domain name? What, it, what is hosting? You know, what, you know, they're looking for the services that they need to do it themselves uh, on the one hand. And then uh, on the other hand, there's a lot of concern about who they should hire maybe to get that done. Um, uh, you know, I'm wondering if we might just start at that super basic level uh, for folks who feel confident about maybe able to do this themselves, what are the, what are the basic um, considerations for somebody who's uh, just building their own website? Awesome. So there are three kind of pieces, in my view, to building a website. The first, as you mentioned, is domain registration. That's the address where your website's gonna live. So uh, I'll see, I'm gonna use my own personal site uh, as an example, as we discussed this. So geesakalakis.com, that's it. That's the address. And I, you can go pretty much anywhere to register a domain. Uh, I tend to use GoDaddy for domain registration. The only thing that you want to keep in mind for registration is uh, if the administration um, portal that the domain registrar uses isn't sophisticated, you might run into problems down the road with uh, updating technical things. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that so I'm going to keep it kind of basic. Uh, so, but the, Google has a domain registrar. Uh, there's a bunch of major domain. I mean, between Google and GoDaddy, I think you've got your bases covered there. It's usually about 10 bucks a year for domain registration. Uh, and that just, that gives you access to owning the uh, domain. A big thing with domain registration in the context of working with others, make sure you own your domain. So I'll talk about this throughout uh, each piece of the website puzzle, but it's really, really important that you, if you hire somebody to build you a website, some of the more nefarious um, marketing vendors will actually register the domain that you're gonna use for your site under their business. 
And then later, if you ever want to leave, they hold you hostage and say, hey, we actually, own, you've been renting your domain from us. And um, so that's a big issue. So always check to make sure your domain is registered uh, to your business or register it yourself, right? And then you can give your uh, vendor access. But if you're going to do it yourself, not an issue. But for those that are working with our folks, make sure it's really important that your domain and, and really all of your accounts and your data, that you own them. They're not, you're not licensing them. Well, we can talk more about that in some different contexts. So that's registration. The next big piece is hosting. So that's the, uh, we'll call it the space where your website files are going to live um, online. So it's kind of like, uh, it's like the foundation, maybe if we're gonna use a house example. So you got the registrations, your address, the hosting is kind of your, your plot of land. Um, and I'm a big fan of WordPress. Um, you know, I know that we talked uh, and some, there's been some conversation about Wix and some of the uh, other website builders. I'm not entirely opposed to them. I know, especially for basic people like the, what you see is what you get editors with Squarespace and Wix. Um, there's a big, there's kind of two big buckets in this world. There's proprietary, uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. We're, I'm already jumping into content management, but um, th the reason that that happened is because Squarespace and Wix, they bundle hosting and content management into the same bucket. Whereas WordPress, we're going to separate hosting from content management. So let's just stick with Squarespace and Wix. So Squarespace and Wix, they handle your hosting, where your uh, the where your files are going to live, the plot of land, uh, as well as the content management system. But the content management system is proprietary, so that means that the software you're using to build your website is owned by Squarespace and Wix. You're just licensing it, and so uh, while there are a lot of advantages to the uh, the ease of use in the short term. Um, for longer term investment in your website, like I talked about before, I'm big on owning all of your own stuff. And so if you ever tr decide you want to change platforms or you don't wanna work with Squarespace or Wix, you're gonna have to go through what's called a migration process and that's gonna cost money. And so my attitude is, is from up, up front with WordPress, WordPress is open source, it's globally supported or it's got seemingly limitless functionality. I think I'm going to throw a stat out I've seen floating around like 30 some percent of the web is actually on WordPress. Uh, it's constantly being updated. So there's not, you know, you got security things. Not that Wix and Squarespace have those issues, but the big difference is WordPress open source software. You take it with you wherever you go. You can put different themes on it so you can change the look and feel of it. Um, and you don't have to, once you're on WordPress, it's kind of like you never go back to proprietary. Um, there are some exceptions we could talk about that maybe Wix makes Wix or Squarespace makes more sense. If you really twisted my arm and said pick one proprietary platform, I'm I suggest Squarespace. Um, Squarespace gives you a little bit more flexibility in terms of some of the quote unquote SEO functionality. So I think it's important that you have the ability to update what's called a robots.txt file and create redirects. Um, I, I know that there's some limitations with what Wix does there. And if you just search for like Wix SEO issues, you can ferret some of those out. But um, Squarespace, if you want to go proprietary, uh, if, you, if, you, you know, if you're sitting around and you're like, hey, this is a great time for me to really make more of an investment in learning how to uh, administer my website, might be a good time to start diving into WordPress. On the scale of uh, total novice to, um, you know, I don't know, Bill Gates, the complexity of uh, WordPress is probably, in my opinion, and again, I'm biased because I've been doing this for a long time, um, it's probably like a four. Um, so it's not super basic out of the box or some configuration, but the great thing is, is that as an open source platform, there's limitless documentation on how to configure WordPress and get the basics right. So if you go, if you do decide to go WordPress, they're a big issue. And this is the same issue that you run into with Wix and Squarespace sometimes is speed matters a lot online. Uh, you know, if you just think about it from your own personal experience, like you, how many times you're willing to wait for a slow web page to load, you're not, you're going to move on, uh, you're going to click back. And so the same thing is true for potential clients or people doing research. Um, or trying to find information about you, they're not going to wait. They don't have patience. And so uh, the hosting plays a big role in how fast your pages are going to load. Um, and, you know, it varies from platform to platform. But my, if, you, if you ask me, again, twist my arm, pick one. I'm a WP engine that's managed WordPress hosting plus WordPress. Um, and they've got a bunch of documentation on how to speed sites up. But we found that uh, benchmarking across a lot of these platforms, that's the one that we are currently using. So... Uh, that's what I would recommend from a, a hosting and um, content management system standpoint. I'm going to interrupt. I, I'm going to 
probably jump uh, jump way too far in, but we, we've had some questions. Um, one that I, I know Mike's going to be taking care of, which people are asking for your book. Um, the, uh, the other one that's kind of pop, popping up a little bit here is uh, Google Analytics, and people are talking about trying to get that incorporated in the system. Now, I, I'm assuming you're going to jump into that here in a little bit, but I wanted to make sure to bring that up. There's a few different things and terminologies that I, I want to make sure um, I have down correctly. Of course, we're talking about SEO um, to some extent, search engine optimization, wanting to make sure that if people are looking for you, that you can be found. But I think to me, Google Analytics is almost the opposite end to try to track who's seeing you. And, and both are important to different extents. But um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that in regards to WordPress itself, how you'd get Google Analytics set up on there. Sure, great question. So, um, yep, I agree. So Google Analytics is basically measures a bunch of data about how your pages are being found and being used. And so they're great for, you know, this is a, I'm getting a lot of people that are finding me on, whether it's Facebook or an article I wrote for the bar or something, and they're coming to my site and interacting with my site. So it, it, Google Analytics is great for understanding how people are finding you and what they're doing when they get to your site. And so, you know, obviously you want to, uh, in the kind of, closing the loop on your marketing, the ideal situation is to say, uh, this source is generating these visitors who are turning into these potential clients who are turning into these clients. And then you can start doing things like a return on investment analysis on your different marketing efforts. So time you're spending writing, uh, maybe if you're buying Google ads or you're buying Facebook ads, then you can get really granular, but that gets a little bit more uh, complicated, but Google Analytics is a great tool for that. Uh, another is, tool. That, is that something oh. that uh, you, you essentially, my understanding is, and it's been a while, I did put Google Analytics, <laughs> Analytics into to my website, but my recollection is there's a, a chunk of script that I'm opening up and I didn't use uh, WordPress, but open up the back end and I think there was a specific spot that I popped it in. Do I need to pop that into all the, diff all the different pages that I have? Is it one set location for doing that? Uh, what, what's the general policy for that? Yeah, great question. So you want to have that code snippet on every page of your site. Most of the content management systems, including both Squarespace and Wix, will have a, um, a dedicated field on the back end, as you mentioned, where you just enter the, um, the it's basically the ID of your Google Analytics property. And so then they'll, they'll, they'll populate the code automatically on all of your pages. WordPress is the same idea. You just take the um, the code snippet and paste it into. There's most of the themes have a, a dedicated field for enter header or footer uh, code, and it will add that code to every single page of your site. So you don't have to do it one at a time. It'll there's a way to do it globally. Um, another thing to think about this, I guess. I'm gonna mention it for the folks that might be more intermediate or advanced is to check out Google Tag Manager. So Google Tag Manager is another tool from Google that allows you to track uh, things on your site, um, including adding the Google Analytics code snippet. That's why I mentioned in that context, but um, yeah, it's really, it, and it's free, right? So you might as well go create a Google Analytics account. They, they walk you through it pretty straightforward. You just copy and paste the code. If you use whether whatever content management system you use, just search for add Google Analytics to my to WordPress or add Google Analytics to my Wix site, and I'm sure you're going to see um, some step by step documentation. But it's it's literally copy paste the code, save, and then you're off and running. And and Google Analytics has a feature to test to make sure your code is actually working. It'll say you know you can see real time visitors and it'll verify the code was installed correctly. So really, not if you can copy and paste, you can add get Google Analytics to your site. Uh, another big tool in the tracking and, uh, you know, I think that there's, and I know we're going to, we're going to spend our time focused because that's the, the real topic is on web design and development issues, but, you know, understanding, uh, who your audience is, what they're looking for, um, how they, what kind of searches they perform, like is really important work, uh, to do before you even update your website, because, you know, that, 
everything on your site should be informed by that research, should be informed by who your audience is, what your marketing positioning is, how people are finding you. You know, I think a lot of lawyers, like they get the, oh, well, people are going to look me up online by name or firm name when they're referred to me or my clients want to find information about me. And that's true. And that, you know, you definitely want to have pages that are optimized for your name and firm name. But the overwhelming majority of ways that people use search engines are actually to do research. So business lookups are a much smaller subset of the total search volume. Um, and so anyway, th th that leads me to talking about this next tool, which is called Google Search Console, another free tool from Google. And again, you just drop some code on your site. It used to be called Webmaster Tools. Uh, but the big, the, the really nice thing that Search Console does is it gives you impression data. So impressions are the number of times that a query was performed in a given time period on Google organically. Um, and it'll show you your average position and the number of clicks that you got. So this is a really useful tool to look for the types of questions that people are asking in the context of your practice, um, you know, how people might be looking you up by name, whether your you know, quote unquote brand awareness is growing. So the more people that are looking you up by name or looking up your firm name, your footprint is growing. And so th that's a very useful tool. And um, you know, again, that's all the platforms that will work with. You just gotta drop some code and, and configure that. And then the, the third Google tool, which is free, and this is re a really, really important one, is called Google My Business. So Google My Business, a lot of, um, there's kind of a, it's kind of tongue in cheek of whether Google My Business is more important than your website. But if you go and search for uh, a lawyer, or really any business by name, Google has this uh, tool essentially called Google My Business that populates a uh, one box. So on a search result, you can search my name if you want. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've used Tim Balland as a uh, example okay, for good. this in the past. Oh, He's got good reviews on his, so okay, I know. <laughs> I don't think good. he'll yeah, mind. Yeah, you always if, want to be uh, careful of that, right? Um, uh, so. so this is a good live example here. Yeah. Um, actually, oh, there it is. Okay, so on the right-hand side where it says it was the photo and it says uh, Balland Law Office and there's the reviews, that's all being populated by Google My Business. And so um, I really encourage folks to go investigate that uh, because – that's often the first impression, even before your website, when someone looks you up online and, you know, your potential clients want to see uh, other clients uh, singing your praises and, you know, are you open during COVID? What are your hours? What's your, you know, all the basic information. There's a great uh, report called the Clio Legal Trends Report. It's free. You can go download it. But Clio did a bunch of surveying of, um, legal services consumers, lawyers, they, they incorporate some of their own system data and identified a lot of like the big problem areas uh, where there's a gap between legal services consumers expectations and lawyers expectations. And so there's a lot of great information in there about the types of things that your potential clients want to see that might not be intuitive to you that you should be including on your website, uh, that you should be building frequently asked questions pages on your website for. Um, and so the content, that's, that's kind of the third big bucket getting back to my kind of my big three with domain registration, um, the hosting content management and the content itself is the, like, the most important thing. And again, that's another area where be careful if you're doing it yourself, no problem. You own all the content. Um, but if somebody else is helping you with content, make sure that your services agreement doesn't say that you're licensing the, con the content, you know, over the years of doing this, and maybe I just take it for granted, but I always think like, I'm always shocked to see um, how many lawyers that I talk to that haven't read their master services agreement with their marketing agency. And it says all sorts of stuff in there that, uh, when I read it to them, they're like taken aback. So make sure you're reading those agreements. Yeah, I think that's just uh, good due diligence um, and make sure you own all of your accounts, all of your data, all of your website materials, content. Um, so, and, and I think that's a good uh, jumping off point for some of the basics. Like for me, Google my, between Google My Business and getting your website set up, those are table stakes because legal services consumers expect to be able to find information about you. Um, it's part of your appearance. Um, they just, that's, that's where the expectation is today. If they can't easily find information about you. It says something to them about you. Um, you know, it's, we talk about this in the context of the email address that you use. It's no different than um, how your office is configured or um, how you show up for meetings. Uh, it's all part of that, uh, you know, those, those impressions that are made uh, in your client's minds. 
I'm going to take a quick step back maybe and ask about, um, unless Landon, I'm missing questions from, from chat. Um, nope. But uh, the, I'm, I'm thinking about like a GoDaddy, for example, when you run through the process of registering your domain name, you're offered a whole set of other services, other domains, um, you're offered, um, I know that WordPress, uh, they used to have a package with WordPress where you, where you could get your hosting and your registration. Do you recommend uh, doing this all separately, sort of in the one, two, three step process that you're talking about here independently, or um, are some of these deals a good offering? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So uh, GoDaddy, like I said, I think great for domain registration. Uh, I think GoDaddy for some of their hosting, the, the, so GoDaddy has uh, economy class hosting. It's a shared host and GoDaddy is extremely popular. So what that means is, is that uh, some of their servers have a lot of sites on them. And GoDaddy is, you know, I think they're generally aware of like site speed issues, but they're not, you're not paying GoDaddy to optimize for speed. And so nine times out of 10, if you take a GoDaddy economy class hosting package, you, so you, you, do, you register your domain, you buy hosting through them. Even if you're on WordPress, you're going to find that the hosting is slowing you down. So um, if you if you upgrade the hosting with GoDaddy, like I, I think that if you're doing domain registration, your SSL certificate, that's another issue we didn't talk about, but security is really important. Um, definitely get an SSL certificate. Um, and you're doing a, a higher version of their hosting, a little bit more expensive. You know, we're probably talking 15 to $20 a month for hosting. I would, I think GoDaddy can be fine for covering all those things. I wouldn't use their website builder personally. I would, if you can do WordPress, I think that's fine. Um, a lot of their other, they have a lot of other like um, offerings that uh, frankly, I don't, I've read through a lot of them and I can't make heads or tails of what it's actually doing. Some of their marketing stuff I would probably not do, but domain registration, uh, a, a not economy class hosting, WordPress from them, SSL certificate from them for security. Uh, even their email uh, hosting, I think is all totally fine, but website builder and some of the other ancillary marketing things, I probably wouldn't purchase those. So I wanted to uh, take a, a different direction for a really quick second. Um, as a solo practicer, a practitioner, I will say that I probably, well, in the beginning, I was probably getting about three or four, maybe even, um, uh, on a good week or a bad week, I was getting maybe eight calls a week of people wanting to wanting to help me out with my SEO. Uh, um, me too. That, that they'll throw me up and I'll, I'll be number one on the Google list. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> and so I get a lot of these calls and I, I, I still do. It's uh, died down a little bit, thankfully, and I'm not sure if that's because, um, you know, I'm a little bit more solid in my practice and I've been around a long longer or maybe because my blocked call list is getting longer and longer. Um, but you get a lot of these calls and a lot of people advertising that they're going to assist you with SEO. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah. Um, so first I would say go search for um, Google's search engine optimization starter guide. So Google has a guide on SEO that uh, I think will help inform a lot of the more suspicious uh, SEO spam. Um, and, and, you know, the other thing to think about it is, is most of these uh, emails you're getting, these outbound solicitation emails, you can very confidently send them all to your spam folder and never respond to them and you're never missing out on anything. Um, you know, there are th in, the, in the context of SEO, we kind of sh shorten things up to some buckets here. Uh, I like to break it down to three things. One is there's the, the technical fixes on your site. And so some of this goes to some of the things we talked about with the platforms, but um, you know, the web is a really dynamic place. And so all sorts of weird technical problems arise from your websites. I think that someone has some SEO knowledge that can help assist you with the technical aspects of your site can make sense. Um, it's more like gardening, right? So it's, it's an ongoing thing and you wanna make sure that you know, you're, you've got proper 301. I'm going to get a little technical here, but you see 301 and um, 404 pages, um, making sure that you, all your pages have meta descriptions. You know, some of the platforms handle some of that stuff, but they also create some garbage. And so someone that can help you with that, I think is valuable. 
Uh, the second thing an SEO can do is that research aspect, right? So they can they can mine for uh, keyword strategy and help you uh, build themes on keywords and then, and then add those to your site. I think that that's a valuable uh, service that an, an SEO can provide. But the big thing that uh, make, moves the dial the most in SEO is the ability to earn links from other sites back to your site. So all the thing, all the technical stuff um, in, in for our purposes is more like kind of table stakes. Like you gotta, it's like, uh, you know, you got to have the foundation, you've got to have some walls, but it's not going to keep the rain out without a solid roof. And the roof is really the links. And so the uh, links can happen all sorts of different ways. You know, if you register for a profile in a legal directory and it has links back to your site, that's a link. And so I always try to say that the links to your site are kind of like a unequal democracy. So links, a link from CNN's homepage is going to be able to carry a lot more uh, weight than a link from, um, you know, a basic legal directory. And, and, and lawyers should be familiar with this idea, right? It's just like case citations. You know, the case citations, they're the most authoritative. They pop up all over the place. That was essentially um, in the context of academic papers. That's what Larry Page originally invented when he invented Google's PageRank algorithm. It's basically a calculus of um, citations uh, to a particular paper. And so he applied that to links. So links are basically the citation back to a different page. And so they use their fancy math to organize the information based on a search query based on those citations. So in this conversation, unless an SEO person can tell you how they're gonna help you earn links, where they're gonna help you earn links from, um, you know, I think that that's probably the most valuable service that an SEO can provide. And it's, it's kind of like digital PR, really, if you think about it. It's just it's getting your pages in front of an audience who's gonna be interested in them and willing to link to them. It's developing relationships with local journalists. It's um, helping coming up with campaigns, you know, like a local sponsorship campaign. We're really big and local. Most of our clients serve a local community. And so that the Google My Business listing also populates that map pack in a search result. So it's those, those three little listings. That's where we find most of the attention goes. Uh, but you can pretty, that was a very long-winded way of saying, you can pretty safely ignore all of those uh, SEO spam messages. You're not missing out on anything. Uh, start with Google. I always say, start with the horse's mouth. You know, I, I'm a little bit uh, cynical about some of this information Google puts out, but for the basics, uh, all that information is right there. They tell you about questions you should ask your vendor, questions you should ask your SEO, obvious things that you should avoid, uh, manipulative things that you should, that can get you in trouble. So it's all right there for you. That's the amazing part about the internet. It's all there. It's all free. Uh, all you got to do is go read it. When I, you I haven't my mentioned. General, oh, go my, ahead. my general uh, policy has generally been with SEO. If they're cold calling me, something's not working on their end. So it's probably not going to work. Right. I think that's a, <laughs> a very uh, astute observation. That's great. You, you haven't mentioned uh, uh, maybe with reason the the, the new GTLDs, uh, the dot lawyer, dot legal. Uh, I've seen more and more of those, but um, I'm guessing those do not drive um, SEO in any way. Yeah, I wouldn't think about it in the context of SEO, context of SEO, excuse me. Um, they can be decent for branding, right? So if you want a, uh, a very memorable domain name, you know, uh, gee.law might be very memorable for folks. But from an SEO standpoint, Google's not really giving additional uh, weight to those uh, TLDs. Uh, there could be some arguments to be made that if you're like your TLD has a keyword in it, then maybe that will help. But this is what I always say, go look at the search results for competitive keywords and tell me how many different TLDs you see. You don't see very many. Uh, most of them are still dot coms. Occasionally you see one pop up there, but um, I think it's a pretty good anecdotal indicator that the, they're not really helping with SEO. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, to me, it's wild how much, I'm not a domainer myself, but some of these domainers, they're charging thousands of dollars for these different uh, TLDs. And there's a lot better way to spend your money online than an expensive law TLD. It, and uh, we got a quick request for the event code. I noticed that we're at 830, but um, continuing on, uh, one question that I have in regards to that is, you know, the dot coms have been around for a, a while longer. Uh, I think it's more common for people to look for those. Maybe it's because those organizations have been around longer or that domain's been around longer. Would that be offsetting some of the searches there a little bit? It is maybe it's just dot legal hasn't been out there as much and, and that's why you're seeing more dot coms hit the top of the list. So if you Yeah, no know. doubt. No doubt about it. I, I was just kind of suggesting that um, if the if you if the dot law uh, TLD 
had some additional SEO weight, you might expect to see them jumping ahead of some of the dot coms. But yeah, no, I mean, most of the sites that you see rank, they rank mostly because they have acquired links. And so the longer they've been around, the the more likely they've had time to acquire those links and older links. And um, so, yeah, I, there's no doubt that the, uh, it's not a, it's not that the, the dot coms have a, a huge competitive advantage just that they've been around. Um, and so it's not that, I, I don't even think the dot law is like a bad idea. It's just don't do it for the purpose of some, for some SEO juice. But that's, I guess that's really my the essential part of what I'm trying to say. I should uh, uh, prepped better for this uh, meeting, but I wonder if uh, you have any websites you might recommend, any lawyer websites um, uh, th that we might take a quick look at that you like as uh, they don't have to be local, obviously. I've got some ideas for websites that I, I like from some of our members I'd, I'd be happy to bring up, but do you have a recommendation of a, of a well-designed website? Yeah, so first I would say go to uh, Lawyerist. Dot com. They, they publish, uh, they do a contest on websites. And so don't take my word for it. You can see some uh, crowdsourced uh, opinions. Um, but, you know, I, I think the other thing too is, is when you ask me like, what do I like? I think this is a really important um, point is your vendor and even yourself, it, your opinion beyond just the, I feel like my website's professional, it doesn't really matter. What matters is, is what does your target audience think of your website? And so uh, we get into these conversations about design and the color blue and all this stuff. And it's like, uh, all of that is more of just like what you like. And would you hire a lawyer from a website? Probably not, you probably know, you're a lawyer, you probably know a lot of lawyers. And so how you use the web and search, um, it's not really about you. And so, so when I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond to that question is like, number one, my opinion really doesn't matter that much, but I will tell you this, some of the websites I think that are good guides for um, uh, the substance of the website, go check out SCOTUS blog, um, go check out uh, Bill Marler's uh, websites and blogs. I think he does a really nice job of putting uh, content out there, but I'd be much more focused on uh, spending time uh, understanding what people want from your website and then publishing content that delivers on that than I would about obsessing over, you know, whether I use a blue header or a red button. Um, you know, that stuff, I'm not saying that stuff's not important, but the content matters a lot more than the design. Yeah, that, that leads me to another question about, you know, as we're redesigning based on our new normal here, I mean, there, there's a, what I love about SCOTUS blog is that there, there is a ton of content here. I mean, if this is the first place that I go to learn about what's going on at the court. I mean, they've been around a while. Um, they very famously uh, was during the ACA decision, uh, the, uh, the Obamacare uh, decision. Uh, they were the only ones to, to have done the reporting correctly uh, uh, you know, everybody was trying to get uh, reporting out uh, after the decision within minutes. Everyone got it wrong <laughs> because they were just, uh, you know, but, but these folks uh, um, uh, really demonstrated their value by um, uh, being true to their form, I think. Um, you know, and I wonder as, as uh, you know, it, not the color blue, but when we're thinking about content, are there features like um, access to the client portal that should be highlighted? Or, you know, oftentimes we talk about, well, is your phone number readily accessible? Or, um, you know, is it clear how to, how to contact you? Or, or is there a lot of visual stuff that's just kind of in the way? Um, but, but considering our new normal now, what, what, uh, you know, are there uh, access points that we should be uh, considering, uh, you know, the, the Zoom link or whatever, you know, uh, schedulers, things like that, that um, folks should be thinking about adding? So absolutely, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna preface with again know your audience, right? So if you're if you serve a, an audience that's not inclined to interact with a Zoom link or use a Calendly link, you know if you serve a, an older demographic, probably not a priority. So understand that audience first. Ask them questions. How would you prefer to communicate with us? How would you prefer to do scheduling? You know, some people are still gonna tell you, look, I can't I can't use your Calendly link. It's not working on my computer. Now, on the other hand. I think it's safe to say, and my experience has shown me that we're moving in a direction of a lot more of these uh, features being embraced. And so uh, for sure, to me, 
the cal giving people, so number one is giving people options, right? Uh, Calendly, we love Calendly. There's acuity, a scheduling link, I think is really beneficial. You think about it, your mate, you're, instead of having to go back and forth through email 20 times to schedule something, it's right there. Um, the, uh, the other big things on a website, uh, and we talk about this in the context of COVID a lot, is if you're, th the less friction that you can create for potential clients to sign documents, uh, pay you, uh, the, the easier you make it for them, the better experience you provide them, the happier they're going to be, the more likely they're going to sing your praises, the easier it's going to be to get your next client. So uh, you know, I noticed that you had uh, Law Pay as an uh, advertiser on your site. So thinking about things like Law Pay, uh, thinking about uh, schedulers like Calendly, using DocuSign or HelloSign or um, some other uh, e-signature tool and publishing that information on your website so that people know that they don't have to come drive and drop uh, off, drop off documents. They don't have to, um, you know, uh, send a check. And then the other big thing here, <clears throat> excuse me, and we didn't, we really focused on websites, which I think is important, but another, just like we're doing right now, going and publishing content on Facebook or YouTube video content, not right. You know, some people don't like to write doing interview style, uh, zoom meetings, and, and talking about the issues that relate to your practice. I'm not talking about giving specific legal advice, but say, you know, cover, like covering the news, like uh, you guys did at the start of this Zoom meeting that's relevant to your practice area. That stuff is really, really powerful in terms of engaging your audience, staying top of mind, being an expert in your field, uh, leading the conversation in your local community. And again, you, People will always, when I use SCOTUS blog as an example, people will say, oh, well, they've been, they've been around forever. They were, they had the advantage of being first. They've got all of this, uh, you know, all this headwind um, or tailwind uh, uh, behind them that's pushing them forward, right? So you don't have to be SCOTUS blog, but take the same concept and apply it to a very uh, local community or a very niche practice. And you can do the same thing. You don't have to be the expert in everything Supreme Court but maybe you can find a very deep subject matter expertise in a very local community and be the leader there. And then people are gonna to gravitate to you. They're going to like that stuff on Facebook. They're gonna share it with their friends. They're gonna uh, start conversations with you there. And that top of mind awareness, uh, you, that, that should, so for, for lawyers that are like, I don't get this web stuff. I don't understand search engine optimization or how search engines work. Hopefully they do understand the power of demonstrating expertise and building relationships. Uh, and now the, the internet and Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter provide platforms to build those relationships and nurture those professional relationships from the comfort of your own home. So you don't have to go to every single trade show or every single in-person seminar. And especially when we're fighting a global pandemic, that much more expectation that people are gonna be able to access this information, have conversations with you. So th that's where I would be spending most of my time uh, if you're if you're thinking if you're sitting around right you know, back to full circle if you're sitting around right now and you're thinking about I want to do some marketing things, go publish video content uh, on Facebook or Zoom or wherever you're going to publish it. Put it on your website too, uh, but that's a much better investment of your time than obsessing over you know a design element on your site or if I'm going to choose Wix or Squarespace. So uh, one question that we had pop up was uh, security level, and I, I know that you mentioned this at one point. Um, so the, the question is GoDaddy wants to charge me more to add what, uh, is called SLL. Uh, well, they have SLL, SSL. I assume SSL, uh, certification. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? I know that you brought that up. Yeah. For a, a lawyer. Pretty, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's essential. You, you, uh, you, so the, the short version is, is that SSL encrypts the transmission of data, uh, from, uh, when the page is accessed. So if uh, the, the most obvious context is if you have a form on your a potential client fills out a form on their website, if you're not, uh, if you don't have a TS, TSL is actually the bigger category, but SSL is more specific. Um, that the data that's being passed to you through your web page can be intercepted. Now, um, there are other security issues like, and this is another reason I think, uh, make sure that you're updating your uh your content management system files because they can be security vulnerabilities. Be very selective about any kind of plugins you add to your site. But in the context of SSL and GoDaddy, most of the uh, domain registrars do charge uh, for SSL. There is a free one called Let's Encrypt. And uh, that's another reason I like WP Engine so much because they have a 
a single button installation for uh, Let's Encrypt SSL. So they don't charge you anything more for SSL, but it's that's that's not really a knock on GoDaddy. I think that that's a pretty common practice. They charge for the SSL certificate, but if you're looking for a free option, I would check out Let's Encrypt. I have a question going back, and, and I'm sorry, I was just responding to another question. So apologies if, if you already addressed this, but you know those phone calls that Landon was getting, I think, isn't there also a question uh, when you register your domain to uh, keep the WHOIS data secret uh, um, so that those phone calls don't happen? Um, I'm wondering if that's what they might've been referring to. Yeah, you can uh, do private registration. Um, I don't feel strongly one way or another. I don't think that private registration is going to solve the spam issue. Uh, okay. <laughs> you know, if you hey, if you're going to publish your website on or publish your phone number on your website, you're still going to run into that stuff. Maybe it will help a little bit for some of like the the robo calls, so like people that scrape sites. But frankly, they they can crawl your site just as easily. Um, people have argued about private domain registration in other contexts. I actually think it's more valuable to publish that it's your site, especially if it's your main website. You know, if you're not really playing the internet marketing game and having all these different sites, I know some people will hide domain registration if they have two different websites and they don't want Google to know that one of them is theirs if it's like a lead generation site. Uh, I'm, I don't think that there's, I, I would just say this, I don't think private registration solves your spam issue. And I think there are some good reasons to actually allow your uh, domain registration to be public. That's just my personal view, but I don't think that it's, um, it, it's not a huge issue either way. That's good so, to know because but, yeah, that's a that's a paid for feature, I think, usually, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Yeah. My response to them has recently been, well, you guys found me, so something must be working out right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, one question, and, and we haven't talked about um, I, we haven't talked about this at all, Google AdWords, mm -hmm. um, which is another Google giant that's out there. Um, I know that when I got up and running, I probably spent it, it I should have gotten at least um, CLE credit, if not uh, a full credit for the amount of time that I spent in learning and understanding Google AdWords and how to do that. Now, that was a decade ago, um, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Is that something worth it for somebody to get out there and, and invest in and look into? Totally. Great question. And, and it's the answers is it's really hard for me to make a blanket statement, but I will say this, and I, I appreciate your uh, uh, sharing your experience there. It, Google ads is not as simple as billboard advertising or phone book advertising. And so Google, uh, let's also just acknowledge that Google's a publicly traded company and 98% of their revenue comes from ads. And so they have a really compelling dog in the fight to get you to spend money on Google ads. So they make it really, really easy to open an account. Uh, they, they do, to their defense, provide a lot of good documentation and guidance on how to manage accounts. But they have no, um, they certainly don't have a uh, financial interest in uh, generating return on ad spend for you. So that means, you know, uh, the amount of money that you spend on your ads, you're getting a certain multiple of money back in fees. And, th and that's the trick, right? So everybody can open a Google ads account. Everybody can go uh, bid on the term lawyer and the auction will uh, decide whose ads show and you can pay some lawyers paying hundred dollars a click. But before you decide to do Google ads, here are the questions you have to ask yourself. What is your average fee for, an, for the uh, service that you're advertising? What is your target cost per acquisition for that fee? So I'm going to use round numbers. Say your fee is $5,000. Your target cost per acquisition uh, based on the finances of your firm should be a fraction of that. I'm just going to throw out some random numbers. Let's just say it's uh, $1,000. So that's a 20% uh, cost per acquisition to fee ratio, which that might or might not work for your firm, depending on your overhead and all these other things that go into the finances of your firm, but you should have a target cost per acquisition. And, and then work your way back from there and say, okay, how many clicks do I need to get to get a potential client? And that would figure out, you know, let's just use some, uh, I'll just make up some numbers. You can do more thorough research on this stuff. But I want to give a framework for doing it. Say it's going to take a hundred clicks. Well, remember, you only have $1,000 to spend to get the client. So if you're going to get 100 clicks, you're thinking 100 clicks is going to get you that one client, then you got to take that $1,000 uh, $1, and divide it by 100. 
and now you can only spend $10 a click. And so what, where lawyers get themselves in trouble is they open an account, they broad match the keyword lawyer, and they say, uh, uh, Google makes a recommendation for a target cost per click. They select that box and now they're spending 50, 60, 70, $80 a click to generate a $5,000 fee. And they spent $20,000 to generate one $5,000 fee. And then they're like, this is, doesn't work. So I know that was a lot to take in, but I'm, I, I, if, <laughs> if you're sitting around with nothing else to do and you don't wanna go publish videos and you wanna go learn Google ads, you could spend from now until we have a vaccine uh, becoming an expert on how to do that uh, and be very, very careful with it because it's really easy to spend money. It's really hard to get a consistent return on ad spend with that. Yeah, it, it was, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, I should have gotten a, at least college credit for that. That was uh, an intense course, a lot of learning. Um, and, and I will say for, for a while, when I was on top of it, it, it was a, a good return on investment. And, um, you know, I, I will say that for myself, I, I dropped out of the loop. I wasn't staying up on it. So I, I canceled my Google AdWords because it, it wasn't, I wasn't spending the time to make sure that what I was advertising, the keywords that I was looking for and the cost per click were um, managed correctly. And at that point, you got to you gotta make the decision to either stop doing it or that it's just going to be a money sink. Well, and that's, and that's another great, um, uh, this experience you're sharing is so valuable because I hear this story all the time. The other thing you have to factor in, as you mentioned, to your cost per acquisition is your own time managing the campaign. And so if your time is worth $100 an hour or $200 an hour or $300 an hour. You have to ask yourself, is my time better spent managing these ads or billing uh, legal services? Um, and so that's always a question that, and that's a, that's a hidden cost in any kind of marketing or advertising that people don't take into account is like, they think, oh, well, if I do it myself, it's free. No, it isn't. It's costing you the cost of your hourly rate because time is not an infinite resource. And then you've got a tie on. I think you've got uh, another obligation uh, this morning. Uh, I, I do have one coming up, but we have one last question that yes. I want to throw out there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> on uh, Squarespace, uh, the individual gets a lot of spam through their contact us. And uh, wondering if you know of anything that has a uh, submitter is not a robot option for, for mm -hmm. Squarespace. So I would use the, uh, I think that the Google reCAPTCHA uh, tool is available for Squarespace. Um, Squarespace probably also has a bunch of their own um, form validation options. If you just search for like Squarespace spam form, they probably have some recommendations, but I like reCAPTCHA. It's a free tool you can add to your site. You'll notice it's the one where it like shows you a bunch of images and you'll be like, which of these images has a car in it? And you click it. Those are the, those seem to be the best at fighting the um, uh, spam. You know, you see a couple of other of these versions of CAPTCHA tools, but some of them become so difficult to read that you actually turn away the people who actually are trying to contact you. And so I'd be careful with that. But, um, you know, there are spam fighting is a whole conversation in and of itself, but definitely check out reCAPTCHA for your contact forms. And also consider this, is your contact form the way that most of your potential clients want to engage with you? You might find out that you have a contact form because you think you need one but the only thing that comes through is spam and all of your potential clients either calling you or submitting a live chat request or engaging with you in a different way. Maybe you remove the fam, the, excuse me, the form altogether. Thank you. And, and uh, Mike, thanks for uh, reminding me that I'm wearing a tie. So I need to <laughs> jump off. <here. laughs> I, um, I also need to, to drop in the, for the folks uh, on YouTube uh, and our listeners calling in uh, just a reminder that the code was three zero seven six four two. Again, that's 307-642. Um, and thank you uh, both for uh, a great uh, presentation. Um, I'm getting emails already saying how much they appreciate your presentation, Guy. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, next week, uh, I believe we're gonna be talking uh, about enhanced paralegals um, and uh, the, the triple LT proposals. Uh, uh, so, come prepared <laughs> for, for that. That'll be a hot conversation. I'm really looking forward to that one as well. Uh, join us next week at the same time um, for that conversation. Um, Gigi, um, 
would you mind maybe dropping in your uh, contact information or any share information you might wish to share into the uh, chat box? Um, you're welcome to do that. Um, one more Q&A here too. Give the website again that started uh, that started Practice Panther. Oh yes. So uh, uh, that guide where Guy's article is located is uh, from a publication when Practice Panther, the practice management platform, got a round of funding. Uh, they did. Uh, um, they put together this anthology of uh, articles from folks like Guy. Uh, it's got a forward in there by Bob Ambrosi. Uh, lots of other folks you may have uh, heard of. Um, Ernie Svensson is in there. Um, Dan Lear is in there. So um, it's, a, it's a nice little resource. It's getting a little bit dated. I think it's a couple of years old now, but it's a, it's a nice resource. Um, probably that would be a good one to update, I think. Um, yeah, it is an update. Record. We'll have to get the Practice Panther people to give us all <laughs> herd the one. cats. <laughs> all right, and thanks I'll, a lot, uh, drop the, Yeah, but my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. I'm going to drop a, uh, we do a weekly tips. So if folks want to join that, I'll drop that in there too. Oh, that's um, awesome. and I'm happy to answer questions uh, at any time. So don't hesitate. Don't be scared. I'm not going to try to pitch you and uh, hard sell you. So uh, just give me a call. If you have any questions, you feel free to email me. I, I, that I appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. You bet. Have a great day, everyone.